so we'll do that. Uh, welcome everybody. If you've just joined us, um, please make sure that you pop your name in the chat and that you have your video on, um, which is really great for us and for our presenter um, to see you. Um, also, please be aware that we are recording this session. So um, if you're not happy uh, to be part of that, it might be best to um, leave us now, but it will be recorded and available um, for students to view going forward. Uh, if you have questions, please pop them in the chat and I will keep an eye on that. Um, and probably at the end of the session, um, we will go through those questions. Um, and I think that's everything. So I would just like to introduce you to our uh, speaker this afternoon for the session, who is uh, Jess Hillman from GNS Science. Jess uh, is actually uh, an Otago alumni, so it's always very exciting, um, especially exciting when we have alumni who are our presenters. Um, she graduated from Otago in 2015 with a PhD in marine geophysics and after a few years working overseas, um, she's been with GNS uh, as a marine geo geologist, geophysicist since 2017. So with that, I will hand it over to you, Jess. Awesome, thanks. Um, so as Lenny said, um, I'm a marine geophysicist at um, GNS Science. And today I'm just going to have a quick chat basically about um, some of the career options at GNS and also a little bit about the work I do and kind of the research that we do in general at GNS. So I graduated from Otago in 2015 um, with a PhD in marine geophysics, as Denley said. Um, I then worked abroad for a couple of years in the USA and in Germany. And then I moved back to um, New Zealand and I've been at GNS for almost three years now. So I'm currently leading the gas hydrates research program, which is uh, primarily looking at hydrates. Um, so under the seafloor on the Hikarangi margin off the east coast of North Island. Um, so I do a lot of my research mostly on doing field work at sea. So here you've got a couple of pictures of me um, doing field work. Um, but I've also been, had the opportunity to help out with some field work um, on land as well in New Zealand. We had a large program in the last couple of years deploying a huge number of seismometers across uh, the East Cape region. Um, and also, as part of my work at GNS, I do quite a lot of outreach, and so I help run um, a project that's called GeoCamp, and this is basically getting kids from of the age of about 9 to 13 um, more engaged in science, um, with a particular kind of slant um, towards geology and earth science. So that's a project that we run in different areas around New Zealand. Uh, last year, for example, we ran it in Northern Wairarapa. Unfortunately, this year we had to cancel it because of the pandemic, but we'll be running um, more next year to make up for it. So to start off with, um, I know some people don't necessarily know what GNS actually is. Um, we're what's called a Crown Research Institute. So there's a whole group of these around New Zealand. Um, each CRI is basically kind of targeted towards a particular sector of, the, um, of, of science. And so looking at either a sector of the economy or a grouping of natural resources. So they were all formed in 1992 and they have kind of predecessors going back quite a long time. So before it's GNS, it was called DSIR and various other kind of components. Um, essentially, our role is to um, look into different areas of scientific research, whether that's um, creating new opportunities in terms of investment, um, developing the economy, natural resources, or looking into things like hazards, um, basically for anything that's for the benefit of New Zealand and New Zealanders. So all the CRIs are monitored and governed by the Ministry of Business Employment, uh, Innovation and Employment, or MB. Um, so that's the, kind of the main people that we report to, and they do um, periodic reviews of all the CRIs just to make sure we're doing what we're supposed to. So we're kind of a mixture of doing pure research and also doing um, commercial work as well. So we're kind of a bit of a consultancy and a bit of a um, research institute. So we're mostly located in Wellington, and that's where I'm based. Um, we have two centres here in Wellington, one in Avalon, which is in uh, Lower Hutt, and that's our main location. And then we have another building up in Gracefields, just across the valley, and that's the National Isotope Centre. So that's where we have a lot of our labs for doing things like um, radiocarbon analysis and so on. So about 80% of our staff are based here in Wellington. Then we also have a fairly large proportion up in Wairake, uh, near Topor, 
and that's mainly looking at volcanology, geothermal and groundwater research. So obviously ideally situated being right next to the Topol Volcanic Zone. Then as some of you might know down in Dunedin we have a very small office um, and that's where there's quite a few of our staff but they're just looking into mostly South Island geology focused work. Um, and that's like just across the road from, well, not too far away from the geology department at Otago. And then finally, up in Auckland, we have a very small number of people. I think last time I checked, it was three people um, working mostly on geohazard risk and society. So in total, we've got just over 400 staff um, spread out across the country um, across those four locations. So the way JNS is kind of um, set up, we have our CEO, who is currently Ian Simpson. He works very closely with our principal Maori um, relationship supervisor, which is Tanya Gerard. And then underneath that, we have the majority of our staff in the kind of science group. So that's about 390 staff. And then the rest of it is made up of what's kind of the support side of things. So basically all the services we need to keep the science side running. So we have a strategy group, business services, people and culture and stakeholder relations. And that covers a huge range of, um, of, ro of roles. So everything from you know, the legal team who help us with contracts, um, finance, accounting, administration, all sorts of things. But the majority of our staff are involved in the science. I think last time um, in our annual report, we had about 85% of roles were directly related to the scientific work. So in the past couple of years, we've actually undergone quite a significant um, restructure in the CRI. And this is our kind of new, the new way that all of our science is laid out. So we have four science themes that everything is kind of grouped into. And then underpinning that, we have the fact that across all of our work, we work very closely with um, Iwi and Maori around the country, trying to help um, use scientific knowledge from um, different local areas, and also making sure the decisions that we're making and the advice we're giving to the government will be for the benefit of everyone. So we achieve mutually um, beneficial priorities. So I'm just gonna go through each of these four scientific themes. Um, give a few examples of kind of the research that we do in those areas and I'll go on to talk a little bit more about some of the specific roles that we have in terms of staff at GNS. So first of all, uh, science theme one, this is natural hazards and risks. So around New Zealand, um, the social and economic kind of loss to um, hazards and risks is estimated to be about six billion dollars. So this is a huge, um, a huge kind of impact on our economy, but also obviously an impact on um, things like loss of life and property. So we're trying to manage the risks of the four capitals and we're trying to make sure that we can give the, um, the government and other agencies the best information to make good decisions going forward in terms of managing these risks. So obviously we've got things like earthquake risks, tsunamis, landslides, volcanoes, all sorts. New Zealand's a great place to be a geologist but it's also got a few risks associated with that. <laughs> Um, and we do quite a lot of work in terms of things like um, just looking at early warnings and forecasts as well. And not just in New Zealand, that also applies to lots of other places around the world. And so if we can help understand that better here, then we can help inform other places around the world as well. Our second science theme is environment and climate. So this is um, focused around a few different kind of sub areas, one of which is groundwater. This is a really, really big deal for New Zealand because about 40% of New Zealanders depend on groundwater as their drinking source. So looking at um, the news recently, you might have seen that Auckland's having a huge um, drought, drought strike this year. Um, so this is something that's going forward is potentially going to get much worse with things like climate change. We also have a lot of our staff working um, in Antarctica and looking at the way Antarctica is going to respond to a potential two degrees, two degree um, rise in the global temperature and how that will feed back into ecosystem responses and also looking at the, the larger um, drivings driving processes behind that system. So the carbon cycle dynamics um, around the world and also how that impacts on a more local scale. So as I said, I'm around Wellington, and if you've been here, um, you might have seen these um, blue stripes we have across the road. These mark the tsunami safe zones in Wellington. We're at particular risk of, um, of tsunamis because of the way the harbour is shaped and the fact that we're just offshore, or just onshore from the offshore selection zone. Um, and so this work was all done based on modeling that uh, NIWA and GNS did um, in partnership. And so this is kind of an example of the way we can be better prepared for these potential threats. We also do a lot of this work um, offshore, not just in New Zealand. And so quite a lot of our staff are involved in improving geohazard resilience in areas around the South Pacific. So looking particularly at the South Pacific islands, 
um, many of which are particularly high risk of things like tsunamis, um, storm surges, and other events like that. Um, looking at environment and climate, um, there's been a really big project going on in the last couple of years you might have heard of. It's called Lakes 380. And this is essentially where a group of scientists are going around coring 380 lakes around New Zealand and using these cores to try and work out how those, basically how the lakes are doing. So what's their health looking like in terms of the, um, the diversity of um, species that are living in the lakes, uh, pollution levels, all sorts of different things. And also seeing how that's potentially changing through time as activities around the lakes change. As I mentioned, we have quite a lot of staff who work in Antarctica. Uh, Nancy Bertler, who works at GNS, is actually currently the Antarctic Science Platform Director. She's on secondment to them. Um, and a lot of that research is basically trying to understand how Antarctica will play a role in a warmer world as we go forward. So moving on, our third science theme is energy futures. So New Zealand is aiming to be 100% renewable by 2035. That's one of the, um, the latest goals. And so we're trying to look at how we can maximize things like geothermal use. So our staff up in Wairaki work very closely with a lot of the existing um, geothermal operations, but they're also trying to look at how we could improve this in the future, how we can potentially expand operations, and also how we can make sure that we don't um, put any of those ecosystems at risk through further activity. We're also looking at energy efficiency and storage innovations. How can we improve how we, how we produce energy in the first place and also how we can make sure we store it more efficiently. And a big part of that is things like material sciences. It's not just um, geology and geoscience, there's a huge range of um, skills that we use here. And finally, underpinning those other three research themes is what we call land and marine geoscience. So this is kind of the, the broad knowledge that you need in order to make sure you fully understand what's happening in all these other processes. So this covers everything from the plate boundary tectonics on Hikari margin, looking at the continental tectonic processes across all of Zealandia, and then right down to the surface processes as well. So how do those deep processes connect into what's happening at the seafloor, on land, all over Zealandia? And as part of that, we generate a huge amount of data. And so one big part of this um, science theme is actually just looking at all the databases and the information that we generate. How do we manage that and curate it so it's available for research in the future? So this is an example of one of the energy futures programs we've got going on. This is um, Jerome um, in the top uh, left there. He's actually involved in a project at the moment up in NIC here in Wellington, looking at how we can improve energy conversion efficiency. So quite often when you produce energy um, and you have things like batteries, they heat up and that's lost energy. You're losing it through heat. So how can we use nanotechnology and new materials to actually improve that and reduce the amount of um, energy we lose in heat? We're also looking at um, expanding, as I said, the um, group in Wairaki do a lot of work with existing and new geothermal um, production. And they're trying to look at how we can directly use geothermal heat without having to use it just as a, a production of steam and then looking at power generation. How can we actually use that as a heat source? And then in the land and marine geoscience theme, one of our biggest areas that we work in is the Hikarang subduction zone at the moment. We've got a lot of research programs focused in this area, one of which is the one I lead. Um, but there's a very big group looking at the overall tectonic structure and how that um, helps us understand things like slow slip earthquake events and the potential risks and hazards associated with this. And so this is a program that's been ongoing for quite a while and it's led by Laura Wallace, who's in the um, bottom right left-hand picture there. And finally, as I said, we do a lot of outreach work at GNS and one of the big projects for us is GeoCamp. And so this is basically trying to engage um, the next generation of Kiwi scientists. So how do we get school-aged children really interested in the world around them and how teach them how they can use science to understand what's happening. So as well as doing the outreach in terms of looking at school children and um, leading projects like GeoCamp, we have a huge amount of information that we share with the public. So whether this is through things like news media, doing interviews, um, the publications that we produce, which is everything from, you know, kind of the field guides like the Fossils of New Zealand one here, all the way through to the, the scientific maps we produce. So this here is the bathymetric map of Tere or Maui, or the continent of Zealandia. And this is a new series of maps that we just produced and they were released a couple of months ago now. And they're available to be downloaded from our website for free. Um, and also we have a huge, uh, we also have the publications, things like Q maps, so the geological maps in New Zealand and the accompany, accompanying books that go with those and a whole range of other things. 
We also, do, we also help with exhibitions. Um, so Te Papa, the museum here in, um, in Wellington, recently relaunched and revamped its um, natural world exhibit. And GNS was part of, one of, the, uh, was part of how we designed um, that whole exhibit. Um, and also on our website, we have a lot of information that can be used for the general public through outreach, through schools, we have lesson plans, all sorts of things. So we have a huge amount of information. And so one of the big things for us is making that available so it can be used not just for research, but also by um, anyone who wants to see it. And in terms of facilities, I mentioned that we have four locations around New Zealand, but across these locations, we also have a really big range of different types of um, everything from geochemistry labs through to rock physics, um, the ice core facility, which is here in Wellington. We have one of the largest collections of, in fact, probably the largest collection of rock and mineral um, samples, mostly in our basement here at Avalon. We have a huge fossil collection as well. Um, and we do a lot of different um, analytical techniques, um, mostly here in Wellington, but also up in Wairaki. We even have a honey authentication facility, which is used for basically assessing the quality of particularly manuka honey to make sure that it's actually, that basically what goes into the jar is actually what it says on the jar. So as I said, we're not just geologists and geoscientists. We have a huge range of staff across all of our sites and we need, we need skills from all of these people in order to, to get the science done. So we have all kinds of geoscientists, geophysicists, geochemists, geomorphologists, everything to do with geo. We also have things like environmental biologists, uh, lots and lots of mathematical modeling that's, getting, that's becoming a much bigger part of what we do. Um, and along, along with that, we have computer scientists, um, nanotechnology, as I mentioned, that's, um, and material science is becoming a really big part of the energy futures component. And then also we have the support staff to go with that. So everything from lawyers, accountants, project managers, all that kind of stuff. So we're not just geology, we do have a really broad range of skills that we need here. And who do we work with? So we do work, obviously, internally, we have lots and lots of um, departments and we all work across those. But outside of GNS, we work very closely with other New Zealand institutes. So particularly with um, other CRIs, such as NIWA, they're one of our biggest um, collaborators within New Zealand, but also universities like Otago, Auckland, um, Victoria, and so on. Outside of New Zealand, um, we work quite a lot with Australian agencies and universities, such as CSIRO. And then further, further abroad, we work with um, quite a few European institutes, US institutes, institutes across Asia, and of course, lots of international universities. So in the three years that I've been at GNS, for example, um, I've worked quite closely with um, institutes in Europe, such as GEOMAR, um, groups in the US, and also universities in places like France and in the UK. So there's constantly interactions going on around the globe. And we also do a lot of collaborative work in terms of field work. So most big operations we have going in the field will involve um, staff from multiple institutes, um, whether that's around New Zealand or around the world. So I'm going to go through just kind of a little kind of snapshot of a few different um, roles that we have here at GNS. Um, and this kind of shows the general qualifications that that role requires and also some of the duties that you'd be involved in working in that kind of role. And there's just kind of an average, so they're not, they're not specific, um, but it might just give you an idea of basically what we do and what kind of skills you need for those things. So if you join GNS as a scientist, um, if you join as a postdoc or a recent graduate, you join at what's called scientist one level. Um, generally this requires either a master's or a PhD qualification um, but that can vary depending on the roles and some of the duties that scientists are involved in is everything from field work, sample preparation and processing, uh, data processing once you're back into the office and then interpreting that data, applying for grants and funding from you know all different sources so things like Marsden's, um, uh, Royal Society, uh, that's Marsden, um, Endeavour from MB, all sorts of things. Um, and then once you've done the work and you've got the grant, um, you have to do the report writing and publishing scientific papers. So how do you get the results out there? How do you share that information with, with the scientific community? And also um, a big part of our role is the reporting. So once you've got a, um, a grant, you have to then show that you've done what you said you're going to do. So reporting to your funding agency and also internally within GNS, just making sure that the management know what you've, what you've been up to. And we do have quite a lot of opportunities for training within the science, um, science roles at GNS. So there is definitely opportunities for um, progression. So as I said, you join as scientist one generally, but then you can apply for progression up through the different roles. 
And a big part of that is internal training at GNS. So we run things like leadership training courses um, throughout the year and other opportunities like that, both within house and also externally. Um, and there's also quite a big component of project management. So if you are involved in a program um, that runs for you know, two or three years, across the time you've got to make sure that um, all scientists who are working together are doing what they said they would, you're meeting all your, all your um, targets and your timelines, um, and that you're sticking to your budget that you said you would, would use. So there's a huge range of things involved in the scientific work. Then um, another kind of big part of the science team is technicians. So generally our technicians have either a bachelor's or a master's qualification. Um, our technicians are very heavily involved in field work. So this is a really practical hands-on role. Um, it's really good if you're involved, if you're interested in science, but you're not so sure if you want to do um, kind of the writing up and the you know, writing applications for grants and that kind of thing. Um, it's a really good kind of role to just kind of get more involved in science and um, be really hands-on with what you're doing. But there are definitely opportunities for further training and even study. So we have technicians who have joined GNS, for example, with a bachelor's and have then gone on to do um, master's degrees part-time while they're working at GNS. And so as well as doing field work, um, technicians are really heavily involved in sample preparation and processing back in, um, back in our labs. Um, data compilation, helping to write up reports and everything in that. Um, and that's quite a big range of things as well. So we have um, field work on places like uh, White Island, for example, here, but also just lots of lab-based work. So preparing samples, processing, running analytical techniques, all sorts of things. And I'm sure lots of you have heard of uh, GeoNet, um, whether it's through our app or just through uh, the news and things. So the National Geo has a monitoring center which runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's based here in Avalon at GNS. Um, they've been running the entire time th during the pandemic when everything else was locked down. Most of our, um, the staff in the NGMC are geohazard analysts and uh, they generally have a bachelor's degree when they join us. And their job is basically to monitor the data that's com coming into the center 24 hours a day, looking at uh, monitoring tsunami, earthquake, volcano and landslide hazards. So we're covering a huge range of locations around New Zealand and lots of different types of data coming in as well. So data processing compilation and kind of two main roles there, but also getting that, public, getting that information out to the public, particularly in times of crisis events, such as the White Island Pukari eruption in December. And then finally, um, there's the support staff. So this is kind of the background um, side of GNS that you don't necessarily read about in our publications, but we wouldn't function without them. So the qualifications required for these kind of roles can vary hugely. It depends on exactly what, um, what's involved, but it could be anything from a bachelor's up to a PhD. And this covers everything from administration, database man management, health and safety, so with all that field work, uh, facilities management, and also a big one is science communication. So getting us, um, helping us get that information out to the public and communicating it in a way that's meaningful. Obviously, um, data, database management used to be a much more hands-on um, paperwork job, and we still have tons and tons of archives and records that need to be sorted out, um, but we are moving towards a much more digital-based world um, and how we can do that in a more efficient way and also make sure that we have everything backed up and secure and accessible. So that hopefully kind of gives you guys a bit of an overview as to what GNS does and some of the different roles that um, go on within the company. Um, but if you are interested, we have our careers website, which is um, up on the slide here. There's also the Science New Zealand website, which um, has information about all the Crown Research Institutes across New Zealand. And you can register your details on that website and sign up for updates. Um, so things like job alerts will come, come up. Um, we also have Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, all of these things. So you can find GNS on any of those sites and you can sign up for updates and just get things like, uh, you know, news and stuff like that as well. We also have a lot of interns working at GNS. So every summer there'll be a huge range of projects going on across um, all the different sites. Most of them are in um, Wellington just because we have the, um, the bulk of the staff here, but we have occasionally hosted them at Wairaki and other sites as well. Um, if you go to our careers site, there's a link to a scholarships page, and this will have information about summer research scholarships that get advertised. We normally advertise these between about August and September. And we also put these on the New Zealand Uni Career Hub website. Um, so you can also sign up for alerts from them. So we host um, interns, sometimes there are more general positions across different groups in GNS. 
but mostly they tend to be linked to specific projects. So for example, the program that I lead, the last two years we've hosted interns from Otago and Victoria universities. Um, and so if you're particularly interested in one area, but you haven't yet seen anything advertised, it's always worth getting in touch with a staff member who is working in that area because they might be able to let you know of opportunities that are coming up in the future. And if you have any questions, um, whether it's about you know, the, the hiring process, um, how you apply for scholarships, any of these things, please feel free to email our careers um, group. And that's their email address on the website, on the slide, sorry. Um, you can also find it on the website. Um, and Sharon, who's our HR person, would get in touch with you and answer any of your questions. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions that I can today. If I can't answer it, then email them and they'll be able to help you. Um, but I would also say that if you do have any questions about specific areas of the research we do, you can find details for any of our staff members on the website and get in touch with them that way too. Um, yeah, that's all I had to say. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to let me know. Um, so on your list of the sort of people you employ, you had that you had a lot of mathematical modelers and data scientists coming in. Yes. Um, this is a field that I'm really interested in getting into, but I'm not like I'm doing a master's in computational neuroscience, so it's sort of related. Um, so I guess my question was, how would you put that into the um, four roles that you were sort of talking about? Like whereabouts would that fit? Would you count as a scientist or more a support person? And also what sort of person would you be looking at for employing into these jobs? So that would depend exactly on um, what role was kind of being advertised at the time, but it could either be a technician role or a scientist role. Um, sometimes those two kind of get a little bit blurred. <laughs> um, there's a lot, obviously a lot of crossover between the two. So for example, mathematical models um, at GNS that I know of work in things like looking at tsunami modeling, um, modeling the um, hazards due to landslides, um, and looking at basically how we can make better use of the data we have and use it for more efficient modeling. Um, so yeah, it depends on whether it's advertised, so quite often we advertise that for specific projects. So it would be, um, working as a scientist under a particular tsunami modeling program, for example, or it could be a more general role where you're supporting a wide range of pro projects. Um, and that might be um, a specialized technician, for example. Um, so yeah, it kind of depends on exactly what, um, what we were looking for at the time. Um, but I do know that most of the modeling people who we have at the moment who come in with like a bachelor's degree would be looking at being a, a technician and then going into being a specialized technician, and then you'd be supporting a wide range of roles. So yeah, so, yeah, sorry, it's not particularly clear, but it varies. <laughs> Hi, I have a question about, um, so under like the careers that are in GNS, you said something about, there was a, something listed as biological, sorry, environmental biologists. Yes. Um, yes. I understand that Niwa and Doc and Manaki Fenua are more for like, you know, I major in ecology, um, mm -hmm. but like what sorts of environmental biologists, um, well, what sorts of work do they get involved in with GNS? So one of the things um, is things like the Lakes 380 project that I mentioned. So that's looking at um, sediment cores, for example. So it's more um, kind of a microbiology side of things for that. So looking at what's living in the mud, how do you use that as an, as an indicator of how well um, that kind of environment is doing in terms of ecological diversity. Um, so there's projects like that. There's also others looking at, um, actually we've had um, biologists working in the hydrates program, looking at how, again, microbiology uh, sorry, micro um, biota in the mud respond to changing environments. Um, so it's kind of a range of different things that we kind of slot into. Um, I'd, what I'd suggest is maybe looking at our website and looking at the um, environment and climate section, and you probably get a good idea of that kind of work through that section. Sweet, thank you. Um, oh, I, had a, I had a question uh, about um, your minerals research. I had a look on the website prior to the presentation. Yep. And I noticed you're doing some work on the black smokers up in uh, the Kermadex. And I was wondering how active is that nowadays? Because I noticed the last update was uh, 2009, I think. So, yeah, <laughs> there are sections of our website that desperately need updating. We are in the process of getting that all done with the, um, with the review being done. Um, so the person who's most heavily involved in that would be Cornel Durand. Um, he leads that section of the project. He actually works down the corridor for me when I'm in my office. Um, so, yeah, there is a lot of work still going on into that, into that area. Um, I know not basically Cornell's a bit too busy and he probably hasn't based it for quite a while. Um, I suggest looking up some of his publications um, and that would give you an idea of what he's been doing recently um, and either get in touch with him or um, Valerie Stucker is another one who's been involved in that work and I'm sure they'd be happy to give you an update as to where they're at at the moment. But yeah, yeah. it's definitely still ongoing so yeah.
Um, I was just wondering, when do you advertise the internship positions? So normally um, we get asked about those. Um, so our HR department asks us in about August to let them know any roles that are going to be coming up. So we generally advertise them from about September to October. Okay. Thank and they'll you. be on the, we get all of ours put onto the, the NZ Uni Career Hub website. So I think you can sign up for alerts from that and that should um, tell you when they come up. Okay, thank you. Just to add on to that, the uh, New Zealand Uni Career Hub website is, is your Otago Career Hub. A uh, career hub that you use to book into this presentation is um, is your gateway into that New Zealand Uni Career Hub. So if you're keeping an eye on that and looking under the jobs tab, you will see all of those internships, internships etc. Will, will automatically come up for you. Okay, thank you. And I'll mention as well, um, we are trying to expand some of our internship programs. So we do have one at the moment, which just started up last year which um, is specifically um, for Maori students. At the moment, that's only running for students from Victoria and Waikato, but I know that Tanya is working to expand that across all of New Zealand, hopefully in the next few years. So that will be coming up soon. Fabulous. And yeah, all that information's on the scholarships page of our website um, there. Just can I ask, you know, if anyone who's listening is, is um, interested in uh, any of those areas that you've talked about and, and some already have we've had some really good questions um, but if, if they email that careers uh, email address and just specify um, specifically what it is they're interested in and you know could they be put in touch with someone will they be able to have that link directly yep definitely so if you um, you can either email the careers hub and then say you know I'm really interested in um, you know, environmental ecology or whatever it is, and they'll find someone who can you can get in touch with and they'll give you the email address to, to email. Um, the other way is just go through our website and find um, someone who you think is in the right area. But if you're not sure, yep, definitely email the careers website and they will put you in touch with somebody who can answer any questions that you have. Great. That's fantastic. Um, the other thing I, I was interested in, you, you talked about the geohazard analyst role um, and you know, if anyone who's listening is really interested in, in that, last year we actually for the first time had someone um, come onto campus, I think it's Mr. Toe talking specifically about, they, I think it was Rocho talking about that role. Yep. Um, and that was organised through the geology department. So again, if that's something that uh, really caught your attention today, just keep an eye on, um, on what geology are doing and that might be in Career Hub as well if, if it happens again this year. Yeah, they've been quite active in um, doing kind of promotion for that because it's obviously quite a new centre still. It's going to be running for a few years. Um, so I think they'll probably be looking to do that again this year, um, potentially towards the end of the academic year. And it might be a virtual event. It might be in person. I don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> when will we have in-person events? I don't know. The, the virtual ones are working pretty well, actually, in a lot of ways. Uh, do we have any more questions? Um, hi, I have a question. So um, you briefly just mentioned before about um, like a project involving microbiology. So I'm currently just finishing up my master's in microbiology. So could you just tell me a few of the specific projects that were relating to that or some people that are in charge of projects so I can sort of look more into that? So at the moment, um, we have had people working in the gas hydrates project. Um, they're not actively doing that at the moment. Um, but yeah, things like Lakes 380, it's one you can look up and also some of our staff are up in Wairaki who look at um, the microbiology associated with the geothermal systems. So they do quite a lot of um, monitoring the ecosystems um, associated with the geothermal systems just to make sure that any production activity isn't impacting on things like biodiversity. Um, so I think one of our staff up there, I think Corrine Rogers was the person leading that but I'm not exactly sure. Um, if you look into the geothermal section on the website there should be some more information there. I've, uh, I've got one question for you. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed that you were talking about the technicians maybe being able to do a master's at the same time as their project, but would a geohazards analysis person be able to maybe attend school at the same time as working that role? I don't know of anyone who particularly has done that, um, but again, it's not an area that I work in personally. Um, it's definitely something you could get in touch with the careers website and they'd be able to tell you whether that's possible. Um, the geo geohazard analysts um, work on a rotation shift system and so whether that would be kind of a bit more difficult in terms of working that around with part-time study 
um, that's something you'd have to consider. Um, but I think it could potentially be, um, it would potentially would be possible, but I'd just definitely check with the careers people because they'd be able to give you a clear answer as to whether anyone's actually done that yet. Okay. And you said, did you say that all of the, the analysis was going on in the Wellington office? Sorry, what was that? Is all of the analysis for geohazards going on in Wellington or is there any activity for that in Dunedin? Um, there's not anyone that I know of doing the NGMC related work in Dunedin. We do have some up in Wairaki, um, particularly in terms of uh, going out and actually doing the servicing of the stations. Um, but the majority of it is, is based here in Avalon and Wellington. Okay, thank you. Awesome, do we have any more questions? Um, hi, um, I have a question. Um, like, how much experience or knowledge do you require, say, when, when you hire a computer scientist or a mathematician? Like, like, in, like the knowledge in the uh, geology area? Um, so I think it depends on exactly what you would be, if it's for a particular project um, and it requires some more specialist knowledge of a particular area, such as the tsunami modeling, then they might require a bit more of a geological background. But for, for I think the vast role, especially from the technician side of things, is actually more the computer science and the modeling aspects that we're more interested in. So if you're you know, really adept at um, coding and um, developing mathematical models, then we can easily integrate that with the geology knowledge that we, we already have at GNS. Um, so yeah, it would depend exactly on what they were looking for, but generally um, you wouldn't necessarily have to have a geology background. Okay, yeah, because I recently so that yeah, um, I think recruiting a statistical modeler on, yep. on the sea level rise. I think it's a current opening, and, and it's well, I think from what I've seen so far, it's basically looking for someone who who can do um, mathematical modeling and, and maybe coding language. But at the same time, um, it seemed to require someone who at least have like some degree like of experience in, in the ge geology side. So uh, for my case, um, I'm, I'm a PhD student in uh, computer science whose mm -hmm. focus is mainly in mathematics. So I don't really have any exposure in the, the ge geology side of things in, in the past. Uh, recently, I've been just like uh, learning a lot of stuff, well, by myself um, mm -hmm. about the, uh, the GIS side side of things, okay. but, but it's still mostly like technical and, and, and all that stuff. So, so I just, so, so I, I was wondering, so say if I, um, I, I don't know, apply for things like this, is there anything, any certain say skill set that I would have to, uh, uh, look for in particular? I think, um, so if you go to the, the listing, the job listing on the page, there should be an email address associated with it that you could email to ask for more information. Because it might be that if you got in touch with the person who's behind the listing, they might be able to say, you know, yes, that's great. We, the, the, the mathematics and the, the coding side of it is more significant for us. Um, but the fact that you've already shown that, you know, you're open to learning more about the GIS and the geology side of things, um, that's really good. Um, so yeah, I think I'd get in touch with them and just ask them more specifically related to that role because it might be, it just depends on what exactly what they're looking for. I think they're, they're probably saying, you know, it'd be great if we could have both, but they might say that if your mathematics and coding skills are really good, that might be enough. Um, so yeah, just, just ask them specifically. I don't know who, um, who's behind the hiring for that role, um, but there'll be an email address there that you can contact. Sure. Thank you very much. Okay. Actually, that's, um, uh, it's actually a really good question and it's something we're hearing very much at the moment um, about, um, you know, letting people know. So if you're doing that extra learning in your own time and picking up the other skills, even though you don't necessarily have a, a qualification around it, um, it's really important in your applications that you actually highlight that, you, that you're keen and you're interested and you're prepared to do that. Yeah, definitely. It just shows us that you're really, really willing to learn new things and kind of adapt to what the role requires. Um, so yeah, even if you haven't got an official, you know, course that you did in, in that subject, definitely put it on your CV or cover letter or something um, and let the person know. Awesome. Some great questions, Jess. 
<laughs> yeah, How are we going? Like enough. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I feel like I can't answer them, but. <laughs> oh, no, I'm impressed by um, how broad your knowledge of the organisation is, actually. Um, and that's certainly something that I've learned um, just by looking at your presentation is, is how broad the opportunities are, um, actually, discipline-wise and, and, and skill-wise and the ability to work. I'm really, um, I'm really taken, I'm looking at your PowerPoint and I'm sure there's a guy sitting there looking down at um, a ravine and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, that looks like a place in Marlborough that we lived a long time ago. <laughs> it looks, looks very familiar. Yeah, we're pretty lucky because we do have such good places to go and do field work and there's always opportunities to go and help out with other programs and things as well. Um, so you get to see some pretty interesting places. Yeah, that, that would be the exciting thing, wouldn't it? Because that's one thing, you know, a real strength we have in New Zealand is, is the um, huge diversity of ge geology that we have. And then, of course, the fact that, that things keep happening. So <laughs> it puts us in the... Um, in yeah, the keep life interesting. Yeah. Okay, um, we won't... Um, make Jess hang around too much longer. There is an opportunity, any last questions? Yeah, sorry, can I just jump in? I just like one quick question, if that's okay. Sure. Uh, Jess, is there kind of like a, like, like a graduate rotational program? So let's say um, I'm not really sure what, like if I'm interested in like multiple aspects, is there like a program where like I can work like three months in one um, project and then jump to another one afterwards? Um, not that I can specifically think of, but it's definitely, we do have um, quite often we hire um, things like uh, postdocs, for example, to work on one mm. specific area. And then you might find once you're working there, you can then get involved in something else. So okay. especially at the moment, we are setting up um, kind of an internal um, job board, we call it. And so that's where if there's kind of small aspects that come up, um, we just need someone to do like a specialized thing for a short time. Then we're trying to get that kind of um, Based kind of more integrated work across the organization and so it's kind of thing that might develop further in the future where we can get people kind of rotating around and helping out different areas um for a short time um but you don't have kind of an official uh, program for that at the moment all uh, right yeah because just because i'm um like i do geophysics stuff but um i'm interested in the geothermal um hmm. as well as seismic so i was just wondering if there's something that i could like i could like jump between but yeah no that's that's cool yeah. Thank you. I mean, quite a few, most of our staff do tend to work across different areas. We're not all just specialised into one thing. Um, so even if you got hired to work, you know, as a scientist in geothermal, there's quite often opportunities to then, you know, help out with a different programme as well, because if your skill set goes across them, then you're always going to be useful to different projects. All uh, right, right. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Perfect. Thank you. No worries. Excellent. Re really good questions today. Um, Thank you, Jess. I really appreciate your time. Um, That's okay. And we didn't make you get on a plane and come all the way back to Dunedin for, for an expo. <laughs> <laughs> so you might have liked the opportunity to do that. Um, I'd just like to um, reiterate um, that the Career Development Centre has a huge amount of support available for you. So hop on Career Hub. Um, you had to go there to book in for this. Um, we have a lot of resources. We have a lot of... Um, uh, appointment spaces, workshops, we can help you with your applications, um, you know, making sure that your CV um, and cover letter are strong as they need to be, really good um, support and, and resources for you around preparing for interviews, all kinds of things. So um, please do come and see us or use what we've got available. We have got so much more online even than before we went into lockdown, which is really exciting. Um, so, so yeah, tap into everything that, because it's all there for you and it's just sitting there. You've just got to tap into it. Um, so Jess, thank you very much. We really, really appreciate that. And, um, wish you all the best for when, uh, you, you get out of home and go back to some kind of, um, <laughs> work environment, wherever that might be. Yeah, no, it'll be nice. <laughs> Okay. Awesome. Okay. Thanks, guys, and um, good luck with the rest of the expo. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank Bye. You.